Hey everyone, Sir Terminal here again. And today I bring you guys my patch notes breakdown. And in addition to that, just like we did last time, I'm gonna bring you guys 15 decks, 15 decks for you all to try out once the, once the expansion drops on Wednesday. So before we actually get to the patch notes, let's quickly go over to the last cards that we revealed. So there were four cards that we revealed today uh, to, before the passions came out, and these were the cards that Jin quote unquote destroyed last, I guess, two Fridays ago now. So, the first card is a Demacia two mana landmark, Petrocide Pillar. So, this one has the effect that all spells cost two more, however, it has countdown two, which means that you play this for two turns, all the spells cost more, but after two turns, this landmark goes away. So it's the first landmark in the game that has a countdown effect and does have an effect once it actually counts down to zero. I think this card is bad. I don't see any reason for you to play this over just playing Stunning Suppressor, especially because the landmark is going to go away after two turns. Uh, playing two mana just to delay the opponent, that two extra turn is not really worth it, right? Your opponent can just still play the two spells and you guys go even in, in, in mana. So... I think this card is pretty bad. I don't expect it to see any gameplay, any game, any, I guess, nobody to play it. Then let's move on to the Obedient Dracon. This card, I think, is really, really good. It's a great aggro tool. So this is a 2-mana 4-1 with a catch. Even though it has quick attack, it's immobile, which means that it cannot attack or it cannot defend. Now, how does this, how does this card actually attack? Well, when another one of your allies attack, when another one of your allies attacks, then this Dracon will attack with it. Meaning that you need to have another unit to attack with the Dracon. It cannot attack by itself on turn two. Which is a really interesting way to design this card. I really, really like it. I think it's going to be strong, but not too strong. I think it's going to be like middle of the ground. I could see this being a staple in a lot of aggro decks because you're always having a lot of units anyways. And this can, this can attack with your units as well. Another neat little trick is scouts, right? So this will attack with the scout unit while still counting for a scout attack. So let's say you have Gristle Ranger, which is what they showed on the trailer for this card. You can attack with the Gristle Ranger, the Abidin Dracon goes with you, and then you attack again, and it happens again. And because this has quick attack, it's very likely that it can get pushed to damage. Unfortunately, it does only have 1 HP, so it's very easy for the opponent to remove it with Make It Rain, Pokey Stick, group shot, all the other one pain removals that are out there in the game currently. Heck, even Gohar and Balfis. So that might be what holds this card back, the 1 HP. But it's really cool to think about of how this can play into some of the aggro decks. Let's move on to the Yoro, uh, to the Yoro, to the Bandle City card, which I guess is also a Yoro. So this is Paparo the Great. When someone creates a random Yoro in hand, so you don't get to pick, so it's not a manifest like the mayor, uh, attack grant other ally yodos plus one plus zero so this card is meant to attack and just create a really big attack because usually you have like a really wide board the problem is that this is only tied to yodos so your wide board has to be only yodos so you can't swarm the board with something like the phase for example from bando city and take advantage of paparo it only works with yodos I don't know if I like this, right? It does, like I said, it doesn't buff a lot of the Bando City cards that are either multi-region and not Yodos or that are phase. You only buff a very specific group of cards, which is why I don't think that this card is really going to see any play at all. And then lastly, we have the Grey Apocatary. So this is a two mana Natsus card, Landmark. When an ally with five plus power dies, create a random follower with five plus power in hand. This card is so good. First of all, it's two mana, so it's really cheap and you can get it in the field early. But it also works because it's gonna be pretty much like unlimited value, right? If this is not destroyed, think about decks that have a lot of five attack units. So think of like Ash LeBlanc, think of like LeBlanc Silver, any reputation deck, etc. Heck, even Yetis, like even if you go like a full Yeti, LeBlanc type of deck, you, have, you always have a lot of five plus power units. And every time this die, you're gonna get a random follower with five plus power in hand and there's a lot of good hits that you can do from this obviously there's also a lot of bad hits but the idea is is that you're never running out of resources right like the longer the game goes you still always have some cards in your hand because the card that you get from this is going to replace itself again so 
I think this card is nuts, 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 nuts. The only downside to it is that the decks that could take advantage of this, so that we talked about Ashley Blank, Reputation, Yetis, are decks that are a little bit weak as they are. And I don't know if this is the card that's going to get them there. But it is it is good to think about this and to kind of theorcraft of how this card might, might make sense. So overall, I think you have two cards that are never going to see play with the Pillar and Papyro. And you have two cards that I think could see a lot of play with the Obedient and the Grey. Obviously, they're both in Natsus. Natsus is just getting all the tools this patch. Uh, so yeah, so so that's it for the quick reaction for these four cards. Let's go ahead and move move on again to the patch notes and actually start our patch notes breakdown. So with this new patch, this really patch was more focused just on the new expansion. So you had all the cards that we have already talked about. If you want to see more of the rebuild reactions for the cards and how I feel about a lot of the new champions like Bar, Jane, Annie, and Ilawi. You can go back to our previous videos where we have card reaction videos for each of the new champions. However, let's actually talk about some of the stuff that was included here because there are a couple of nerfs that were kind of snuck in here into this patch. So, patch notes breakdown. So, they start off with a trailer for the new expansion. So, World Walker, like we talked about. Um, this is a trailer that they already released before, so no reason to look into that. We have a bunch of new cards, about 65 collectible cards. And you can find them Mobilitics, Runeterra AR, or DAC GG. I, I usually prefer Runeterra AR because as you see here, you get a really nice way that the cards are shown. So that's how I recommend looking at them if you haven't seen them yet. And again, we have a reaction video where we talked about all the other cards, right? So with this pantry, we did have a couple of new keywords and a couple of new things. So we had the guide to origin. So origin is obviously the keyword that applies to Jin and Bar. So the Runeterra champion, so they actually don't have a region. You can see here that it's kind of like just, just the general Runeterra symbol. And instead of a region, they have like origins, which kind of gives like a bunch of like special abilities, right? Uh, and will allow you to do like deck building with a special condition. So in the terms, in case of Jin, you're asked to put, put any card from any region that has a skill on it. And in the terms of bar, it lets you put any card from any region that can add shines to your deck. So. Really, really cool stuff. I think it opens up deck building really, really, really wide, especially in the case of Jin. Uh, it's a little bit more limited in the, in the case of Bar because ha he has a lot less, a lot fewer cards that actually at times. But with Jin, you have a ton of cards already in the game that have skills, so you can create some really funny gameplay and deck dynamics in terms of building decks. Let's move on. Yeah, so Winter, Winter Champions, etc. Then we get some new keywords. So you have. You have spawn, which is the keyword that associates with Ilawi, and it just is summons a one one tentacle. If you already have one, you give a plus one plus one instead for each spawn. So if you do a spawn three, like the Buru Luka here, you end up summoning one tentacle first, and then that one tentacle gets buffed twice to become a three three. Pretty straightforward. And then the other one is Boon, which kind of goes along with Bar. So Boon is pretty much the opposite of Trap. So while a Trap does a negative effect, so think of like flash bombs uh, or think of the team of shrooms, a boon does like the positive effect, right? Um, so in this case, the chimes from bar are able to grant a random ally in your hand plus one plus one. So you can get some really crazy hand buffing decks going on here. And yeah, those are really the two new keywords there. If you also kind of origin the best three, obviously they added a bunch of new challenges, blah, 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 blah. And then this patch is the introduction to Path of Champions 2.0. So uh, if you were a fan of Path of Champions, they have a new version now that's going to come out. It's going to reset everything from the first version. And this new version should quote unquote be better. Obviously, we'll, be, we'll see if that's actually the case. I did play quite a bit of Path of Champions. I've, I've been able to be Victor with three different champions, which as I'll discuss later down below. If you're not, if you haven't beat Victor three times with three different champions yet, I recommend you do that. If you have time tonight, as it can actually get you some pretty cool card backs and a pretty cool emote. So we'll see that down below. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No really care. Okay, so card updates. This is what I wanted to touch on. So first, yeah, they explained to here what I was trying to explain to you all that because it's an expansion patch, they're not really doing a lot of a lot of adjustments, right? So they are telling us that the next big adjustment patch is going to be on 3.10, which is going to be in late June. So pretty much about another month before the next set of balance changes come into the game. So 
The two changes that they touched on this patch, though, were both directed to Pirate Aggro and, in general, the Natsus Aggro package. So the first one is going to be Crack Crack Corsair. So it goes from a 1-2 to a 1-1, one, one, meaning that the Corsair can now be removed with Balfies, Pokey Stick, and all sorts of other 1 damage pranks. This is actually pretty, pretty big. I think the fact that he only has 1 health can make it, and even Flash Bombs kill it right away, like, can make this not stay in the field long enough. Like, it's a good trade for the opponent if you play Corsair and then they can battle Feaster right away. Because not only do they kill your Corsair, but they also get a blocker in the terms of the battle fees. Uh, so I think this change is actually pretty big. And might even make me consider not playing this in some gym decks like, that I showcase later on in this in the video. And then the second one was, was to the Imperial Demolitionist, which is going to hit every single Noxus aggro deck. So Pirate hits Spiders, right? Instead of being 3 health unit, it goes down to a 2-2. Two -two. It still has a set ability though, which might be okay, but it does make it a little bit awkward because now you can't have this be like a good blocker, or if you attack with it, opponent could be able to block it and get a favorable block. So you gotta be a little more careful. Now, I'm actually a little bit surprised that this is the only changes that we saw. There's two decks that are really, I mean, actually, I, I would say like three things that are really missing, I think, that are missing from this patch and the balance changing. Faded units and Pantheon deck, right? So I definitely would have liked to see some nerf to that Pantheon Demacia deck, where there is a nerf to Fader or a nerf to Sinif Blade or something like that. But it needed to be touched because Pantheon Yumi is still going to be a top tier deck because they didn't nerf it and instead they nerfed one of the biggest counters to it, which was Pirate Acro, which is really weird. Second thing that didn't get touched was Quicksand. Quicksand is so good, and it's one of the staples of the game, and I think it's way too strong. And it's going to keep a lot of different decks away from the meta until it gets adjusted. And the third thing that I think should have been touched is the Fae package. So that's Rainbow Fish, Gleaming Lantern, etc. Uh, you guys have seen how big the popularity of Affilius was, and there's a good reason for that, right? That package can be a little bit toxic, especially with Rainbow Fish, especially with the Gleaming Lantern being able to swarm the boar. I think those three things need to be looked at next patch if, since it didn't touch a dispatch. I still think those three decks are still going to be tier one or even tier zero. So unfortunately, it means that really the meta is not going to change a ton unless Jin, Annie, uh, and, and the rest of the new cards are able to completely push those decks out of the meta, which I doubt which I doubt. So you're still going to have like Triple Shurima decks, uh, you're still going to have Pantheon decks, and you're still going to have a Fist of Phyllis deck. And now that the Agro Boogeyman is gone, it does open it up for, the door for some other things, but we'll see if that actually does anything. And then the rest of this patch notes is introducing the Pulse Fire event. So it's going to be an event pass centered around the Pulse Fire skins from League of Legends. Uh, so they're more like futuristic styles. Uh, so you can see here a bunch of, we'll, we'll see some of the carbacks and the skins down below. Uh, yeah, sure, usually the pass, the event passes are really good, usually value-wise. They're not that expensive, and you get a lot of free cosmetics out of them. Well, I guess not free because you pay for them, but you get a lot of cosmetics out of them. So I think it's, I think I'll buy it. There's no reason not to. Uh, they're getting rid of the region roads for most players. So if you're not a new player, uh, they're no longer going to continue expanding the region roads. So... I guess that's fine. If you have completed the region roads, you usually already have a pretty accessible collection. So I don't think it matters that you have to wait for longer region. It just kind of sucks because now some of those region specific icons and carbacks might not come back if you do something else. So yeah. And then here we go. So then we have a bunch of skins. So this is going to be Pulse Fire Jin, which has actually a pretty cool animation. If you guys have been watching it long enough, I will always say, I don't think skins are worth their price, but some of the ones that have animation that are leveled up are kind of nice. I still don't think they're worth the price though. So I wouldn't personally pay for them, uh, but if you're a fan of skins and you want to support Riot, this is this is a pretty good looking skin, especially the level up. Uh, you also get Pulse Fire Caitlyn, which also gets an, a new level up. So Jin and Caitlyn both get the level up. Uh, then you get Pulse Fire Aphelios, while he doesn't get a level up, he does get, obviously, the new icons for each of the wound weapons, which is kind of cool. Uh, Pulse Fire Trash. Okay, so it's just the soul animation right here. So they do try to add some animations instead of just being an image, right? 
and then post fire Lucian. Okay, well, I say that, and then you have Lucian, which doesn't have any animation, or anything at all, it looks like. Uh, and then post fire action, which actually looks like, yeah, you can get post fire action from the pen pass. So you have action and also get the all the uh, all the different cho choices from from palace power and phantom and, and uh, sentinel's horror here as well with the new skin and then you have the boar cool oh my goodness this is the cutest thing ever tivers i'm definitely getting tivers now i don't believe i think skins are a rip off but ryo gets all my money with the guardians and tivers is one of the cutest things look how angry he looks this is so cute i'm gonna buy tivers eh. the post fire is whatever it kind of hides some of the tiver charm right like the whole body then you have post fire ship so this one's a boat from the past you get the car back for a virtuoso siblings okay so this is just aphelios obviously action and then lucian and then you have what I was kind of alluding to earlier. If you have not played Path of Champions yet, I would recommend I would recommend playing Path of Champions for you to get access to these cool card backs that are coming out. So this one, the Scroll of Runeterra, you earn by completing one adventure in Path of Champions. So if you complete like the Gents adventure, etc., you automatically get this one. Then you get another upgrade to that, which is pla a plate plaque, plaque of Runeterra. And this is earned by players who defeat a Gamplank. So if you defeat a Gamplank in any of your runs, you get this. Which, you know, Gamplank is a good setting point. You can kind of see a little bit different. This one is kind of like bronze. This one is more like silver. And then you get like the gold with kind of like the master purple that they usually use for master icons. And this one is the gem of Runeterra. And this one is earned if you defeat a victor at least one time. So if you defeat a victor with any of the champions one time, you get this card, which it's actually really cool although personally my favorite is probably the, the the gray one i mean the silver one but the gold one is also pretty good and then lastly we have some emotes so these are all from the path uh, from the post fire event pretty cool i like this one a lot this one is all right <laughs> that's a big eye I don't think i care about it and then this is the last one i wanted to showcase adventuring so this one is earned by you defeating Victor three times with three foreign champions. So earned by players who defeated Victor with three champions and the Pepper champions. So if you have not beaten Victor three times and you want this uh, this emote, you have some work to do by the time this video comes out. So yeah, here you go, some bundles, bundles, etc., etc. Uh, yeah, expeditions are going bye bye. So sorry for those of you who enjoyed this expedition. And then lastly, we have miscellaneous and bug fixes. So miscellaneous so the rank season has finished blah 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 hand counter so they have actually added a hand counter to the game finally it's probably one of the additions that everybody's always requesting since the moment that uh runeterra was a thing so i'm glad to see it that it's actually finally being acknowledged and actually added so i'm interested to see how this actually looks in game uh and then the another the next one is actually pretty big Future seasonal tournaments will take place on a single weekend. So before they used to take over two weekends, Saturday, Saturday. Now they're taking place on a single weekend with open runs on a Saturday, playoffs on a Sunday. This, I think, is a mistake. I think, first of all, open rounds already are nine rounds, which usually take about 10 hours or more sometimes. Usually, you have to wake up to be able to uh, to register at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Your first match starts at 1 p.m. and you're playing all the way until like uh, I think your your last match starts right around 10 p.m. So from the moment that you register to the moment that you finish the last match, you're probably finishing right around 10:30, 11 p.m. Eastern time. So already you're having a long day, and then now you have to come back the next day on Sunday to do it again, right? Usually on Sunday the the top. The top 32 starts a little bit later. So instead of 12 p.m. registration, it starts at 3 p.m. registration. So you get like an additional couple hours of sleep. But it's still a lot to ask for a full week in commitment for a lot of players. Not only that, but it also screws over people that are in different time zones, right? So if you guys didn't know, people from Australia, New Zealand, are all part of the Americas chart. 
So already their seasonal was starting really early, early in the morning for them. I think their, their starting time was like 2 a.m. in the morning. Now they're going to be playing from like, they have to play one day at 2 a.m. in the morning and then the next day have to do it again at 5 a.m. in the morning. I think it's really tough for them. Not only that, but usually they're not able to play on the Sunday. So the, the reason that, because originally the seasonal tournament used to be on Sundays and they moved it to Saturday to make it better for people in like those regions that had to work the next day. But now you get, you get rid of that because you brought it back to Sundays and now you completely removed the reason why you changed it in the first place to Saturdays. So now we're back to like people that might not be able to play because they have to work on that Monday, especially people from Australia, New Zealand, you know, the Asiatic region. Um, it also kind of gets a little bit weird with some of the European time zones. Probably not as bad with, with APAC anymore now that, they, now that the servers are merged, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. I, I mean, I know it's how car, like physical car games are done. I know that's how it is in like big Yu-Gi-Oh events, big other like physical, fresh and blood, whatever, where you're there Saturday and Sunday, or maybe Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But I think with an online game like this, where you're actually trying to have a thousand plus players from all over the country and sometimes over the world, I think it, it doesn't make sense to have it on a single weekend. But, you know? We'll see how that goes. I think it might actually push some people away from competing in seasonals. Uh, then you have a bunch of bug fixes. Uh, no, don't care. Don't care. And Kyoshi Mist, where they were. This is where discarding cards that placed themselves wasn't allowed just to level up. Where discarding cards that had placed themselves wasn't allowing gents. Okay, so this is pretty good. This is pretty good. So I guess there was a bug that wasn't letting gents leveled up. A uh, swift Lancer can no longer create itself. I think that's actually such a weird change for them to make. So they still have the Crimson Curator create itself, but they decide that the NASA cannot create itself. They need to make a rule and decide which way to go about it. Um, okay. Shout out Prentice and Apparently Mr. Fedak and okay, Wins of War and Heal Your Allies. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, Wins of War not really heal your allies. Okay, so before it used to like not heal your ally, and now it does. Ramstein now resolves even if the selected unit leaves play? Oh, that's a huge buff. That's a huge buff. That's a huge buff. So a lot of times you have to be like very careful what you use ramp stands on because the opponent can remove it and, and, and cancel the ramp stands. But now it happens no matter what. Oh. That's, that's nice. That's nice. That is nice. That is very, very nice. I like it. Transposition now uses the reduced cost of a unit, which has had its cost reduced. Not sure what they mean here. Is this to stop like the Karina combo or hmm, whatever? The reduced cost. I don't know. Fits an issue with daybreak triggers for morning light were activating was activated Leona's level of progress. Added error message when player tries to move a challenge blocker. Daybreak triggers for morning light was activated. Isn't isn't that is wasn't that supposed to be the case? Or is Leona only on play? But anyways, I think honestly some of these bugs fixes are pretty nice. Obviously, obviously it's always good. Um, yeah, I mean that that's really the whole patch, right? Obviously the big thing is the expansion. So stick around where we now gonna give you guys fifteen decks. I tried to do at least two or three decks with each of the new champions, and then do a few decks with some old archetypes like Deep. Trolls, etc., that got buffed this patch uh, for you all to try out when the patch comes out tomorrow and for the rest of this week. So, yeah, stay tuned for that. And we'll move on here to who do we want to start with? Let's start with Jen Annie. So, let's begin with the most obvious one, right? That we have all discussed probably as soon as you saw Annie and Jen. And that's going to be a pure aggro burn deck. So I just want to get this out of the way, right off the bat. So this is my version of the deck. So we play triple Annie, because Annie is such a good one drop for this type of decks, right? So you see, they're getting rid of a blocker or pushing two damage to the Nexus right away. Um, and, you know, like, you don't really necessarily need her to level up, but if she does level up, it it's also pretty nice as well. She can synergize a lot because she can also help with Jin. So then we have Jin. Jin gives us the option to be able to play units that have skills from every other region. So even though we're playing Jin plus Nazis, 
we still get access to a bunch of skill units that are really good in like this aggro burn package as you'll see as we go through our, our deck also i was considering with a three gen is correct or just one gen i think three gen might be a little bit awkward because he is four mana and if you get two gens in your hand it's not really great however i do like the i do want to have three gen because i do want to have him in my hand as well for him to give us the Lotus Trap every turn, which is free damage. I mean, not every turn, every time you do like enough skills, which is free damage into the Nexus. So I, I still have to debate whether that's better or not. Now, the rest of the cards are just your typical burn package. So think think of a Spider Aggro, think about Pirate Aggro, think about PNC Burn, and now grab all those cards that have skills in all those decks and put them all together, and you get this abomination. So, how does this look like? We got we got the Cratch of Corsair from Bilgewater. Now, this card they can nerf, so now it's a 1-1, one -one, so it's not as powerful as it was before, but it's still pretty good as a skill unit. Obviously, because we have not as a region, we can do stuff like Rearguard, uh, Saboteur, we could play it regardless, so that's that also sign of the skill. Uh, we can bring the Bone Crew Rookie from PNC, so now we have another card here that can present two damage, direct damage to the Nexus, every time that he attacks which is pretty nice and if the opponent doesn't have a, a, a blocker with three attack you're able to attack twice with the broom crew rookie which is great demolitionist additional burn also casts as a skill uh they get nerfed but shouldn't be a big issue because we do have enough, enough blockers we can play grenadier more burn i really like the station so even though the station is ephemeral when you drop her on your attack turn you can remove an opponent's blocker because you can stun them and then attack with this and if they don't block the stage hand you're pushing you're pushing full damage and by being able to block the opponent's blocker it also allows your other units to also be able to attack and in a really sticky situation where you need to survive just one more turn so think about going like a, i guess a big wounded white flame that has like overwhelm you can punish them if they don't open attack by playing this and stunning the wounded white flame which is not bad. I don't think it's bad at all, uh, either as an offensive tool or as an offense or, or as an a defensive tool. So it's really, really good. Then we bring the Tusk Speaker from Frelier. His skill deals one to all Nexuses, so it does do one point, one point of burn. And because he has Overwhelm, it's very likely that he could get at least two more two total damage to the Nexus with his burn, plus just attacking into a two health blocker. He cannot get chump block as easily as our other units can. Doom Beast, because again, we're just getting the best tools from every aggro deck out there. So Doom Beast from Spider Aggro lets us drain two, and then Augmented Experimenter, just one off to be able to cycle uh, in case that we run out of resources, because we are an aggro deck that can potentially run out of resources too early. And also sometimes I would not mind discarding a gen, to be honest. Like I said, gen is not that great for your aggro game plan. So even if I have like one gen left in my hand, I still use the Experimenter and just get something else back. And then obviously the burn is just going to be further plus decimate. So yeah, this is my version of it. I think this could potentially be pretty strong. Uh, even if there is decks out there that can counter this, it is still something that the opponent has to watch out for and might keep a lot of other decks away from the meta. At the very least, this should still do well into like Shurima decks that are vulnerable to aggro. And it should also do well into stuff like Pantheon just because of how much burn you have with the deck. Uh, so yeah, so... Let's move on to, I guess, let's, let's, conti let's continue with Annie. Let's let's move on to another Annie deck. So let's stick with the theme of like Annie Burn. And if that's the case, I want to go with another version, which is just going to be Pirate Aggro with Annie instead of Twisted Fate. Now you do lose the utility of Twisted Fate, but you do get a really powerful one drop unit that can push a lot of damage. And you can also play the Obedient Drake Count in this type of deck. Uh, now, I did not like him in the Jin Annie deck because I feel like you have better characters to play. But in this deck, the Drake Count is actually pretty nice because he can also synergize with your Island Navigator, allowing the Drake Count to actually attack when you have a scout on the field, being able to attack with the scout units. I, I really like this. So obviously, the rest of the deck is very close to what regular Pyre Agro is. And again, with this season nerfs with Corsair and Demolitionist, but I don't think those nerfs are going to be enough to completely rip the deck apart. So if you're looking for like another variant of like Annie Burn that's not necessarily playing Jin, then this I think is what I would recommend. Um, hmm. 
is there anything else that I can really say around this deck? I mean, like, you know, I'm trying to give every deck at least like a minute or so, but it's kind of tough. I think, I think, yeah, just play it like Parrot Aggro. Play it like Parrot Aggro and just do all your burn damage and just have your Annie be like another powerful one drop. Whether she levels up or not, regardless, Misfortune can, can synergize with her because Misfortune has as a skill. So you do get some value there from that. But anyways, now enough with the burn stuff though. Let's bring you what I think is a decent Annie mid-range list using Annie Swain. So this is that Annie Swain that I was just referring to. Uh, I like it. It's an Annie Swain Bilgewater. So think of like Swain Twisted Fate, except that instead of Twisted Fate, we play Annie. It's funny how we stole Twisted Fate from Pirate Agar, and now we're also stealing Twisted Fate from Swain Twisted Fate. Whether it's actually that good or not, it's a little bit to be, to be debated. Really, the, the new cards here that I'm playing, it's going to be three Annie. Three Watchful Idol, because the Watchful Idol, when it hits itself, it will also advance the Swain level up. Obviously, the Annie skill can advance the Swain level up as well. And then I also like to play two Disintegrate. It's another kind of great tool to remove an opponent's blocker or an opponent's unit, especially when you can combine it with stuff like Make It Rain, or you can combine it with stuff like Half Spider, where you can just block with the little Spiderling and put this on the stack to be able to kill them. And obviously the rest of the deck is just playing kind of like a lot, you know, enough units that you're getting some value, but also enough removal tools that you're able to deal with the opponent's units. So if you're not familiar with the Twisted Fate Swain deck from the past, you're really just trying to build up to, to try to quickly level up the Swain, the Swain and try to lock the opponent down with stuff like Leviathan. Leviathan. Uh, that's still the plan here. Uh, obviously the idea is that Annie, Watchful Idol, can both help you level up to the Swain faster. And the Disintegrate can synergize with a lot of your cards that can block or deal all the damage. Aside from that, you just have a bunch of like regular tools here, right? The deck hand can combine with stuff like Make It Rain or Death Hand, or you can combine with stuff like Annie as well, dealing three to the blocker instead of just two, or dealing three to the Nexus. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, I mean, how, what else I can say? It's, it's really more a control tool, a control deck where you just try to lock your opponent down because you have stuff like Flock, Scorch Earth, right, to remove their units. And then you also have stuff like Leviathan and Swain to let to then lock them down. Now, I do think I, 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 I do think it might be worth it to add some of the other Annie package to this deck. I just couldn't figure out how exactly to make it fit. So I ended up just really just, just doing Annie. If you can't tell from the past three decks, including this one, I just think Annie's a really strong unit by herself, even without the rest of her package. I'm still iffy about the rest of the package and how that actually fits into the meta. Uh, but yeah, so, so those are the three Annie decks that I suggested. Obviously, one of them was with Jin. Uh, so let's go ahead and give you guys the second Jin deck that I kind of have prepared for you. Of course, you wouldn't think I would have covered Jin and not give you guys Copium Jin Yasuo list. So this is what I ended up kind of coming up with. Obviously, I'm not the biggest Yasuo expert, so this might seem like straight up nonsense. But I really couldn't think of like what other way to kind of build this deck to make it make sense and get to you what you what you want to do. So obviously we do lose some tools like the uh, the miniature for Nazis that is sorely missed. But hopefully we can try to make it up with some of the other stunt tools because we can combine some of the units from Target Nazis and bring them into the Ionia package with Yasuo. So obviously the whole idea with this deck is that both Jin and Yasuo synergize really well with stuns, right? So Jin does two to all the stun units. Yasuo also deals like, you know, two. And when he levels up, he's dealing five, right? So both of these can synergize really well with, with, with the, um, the number of units that you can stun. Uh, the only downside is that Yasuo does not count as a skill. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Don't, don't count for Yasuo to be able to kind of skill the rest of the deck is just a bunch of units and a bunch of spells that can either stun the opponent or help you survive to when you can set up the gen and get yasuo so obviously the blade troll is just there as a nice unit that can go really big but just as you have stuff like the sunhawk and the station both of which are two mana stuns uh especially the station can be a really big development bonus share because you can stun a you can stun an attacker and also because the station has a four four stat line Usually you prevent the opponent from being able to attack into her as well. We also have the Sentry, which is also really nice. I, I am playing Triple Shadow Assassin just so that we can try to join to our champions sooner rather than later. And I want I, I like the clubbing way. So 
is is interesting because it's a five mana car right that needs to have nightfall so you need to trigger you need to do something else usually my thought is that if you get this in turn five you're using stuff like the ionian telstones to be able to trigger uh, otherwise you're kind of waiting until like a later turn to be able to do this but the idea is that this is able to stun a unit twice uh, allowing you to be able to actually you know turbo level yasuo and get some value there it might it might not be good as a three off it might only really be a two off uh, but I just really didn't know what else to put in here. And then we have two Sailing Thousand Tells because Joe is very important here to be able to get our champions, which are really key for this deck. Then in the spell package, there's a, a bunch of protection, right? So Noble Fan Deny to protect our units, Steel Tempest and Concussive Palm to just stun and protect our health, Twin Discipline to help us survive, and then two Ionian Toll Tells because I do think, uh, Tell Stones, because I do think that Ionia is really good with Health Pot, Homecoming, or Standing at it, all really been good choices to be able to save your units or be able to do like a sneaky lethal with like a really big fey blade trailer so regardless i think i think this is the best that i can come up with however if you are actually interested in this jazz war type i would just recommend watching like jay sensational right uh because he probably is gonna come up with a much better Yasuo deck than I ever will because that man is like in love with this champion but yeah so this is my idea with Jin. And now, so that's three anti decks, two gin decks. If you count the anti gin deck as separate ones, let's move on to let's do Ilawi. I think let's do Ilawi and see 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 what you guys think about these three decks that I have for you. So of course, it wouldn't be a sermon video without me recommending Star Spring. And this is my first Ilawi deck. I'm probably the first deck that I'm going to try in the expansion. And maybe the one that you guys are going to see a video on tomorrow or Thursday. And it's going to be Ilawi Soraka. So how does this make sense? Well, first of all, Tem you know, this has the same cost as Tamkench. So it's not really a big change. The problem with Tamkench, like the Tamkench gives you the benefit of being able to lock opponents down. Ilawi does different. It lets you be a little bit more aggro. So it gives you a little bit more of a win condition by being able to build a really big Ilawi. Unfortunately for Ilawi, she does require herself to attack to get the spawn one, which means that she's going to take a lot of damage from chump blockers or people trying to block her. That's where Star Spring Soraka and the heal package from Target comes in to be able to keep your Ilawi healthy enough uh, so that you can continuously keep attacking with her more than just once or twice. The rest of the package looks very close to what you will see from, tar uh, from, from TK Soraka, except mixing some of the package from Ilawi. So we still play the Courier. Obviously, we played three Star Spring. I don't even gonna touch on that. We still play the three Courier, uh, Courier. Uh, but instead of playing the uh, Star Shepherd, we're playing three Watchful Idol. So Watchful Idol can synergize because it can damage itself. And if you have a Star Spring, then obviously you're able to heal. If you have two Star Spring, then you go infinite with the Idol. Now, that's that's not likely to happen. If you have two Star Spring, you're usually already winning anyways. And that would take four board space, right? Two Star Spring, the Idol plus the Tentacle. So you have to be careful a little bit about the board space. Uh, but, you know, the idea is there. That you can you can you can do one star spring at least, allowing this thing to stay in the field a little bit longer. You can heal it with guiding touch, etc. Uh, and it's a nice way to, to start triggering and start getting your 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 tentacles. Obviously, we play box of and croaker, those haven't changed. And then I do always think that three protector is the correct play. I, I would never I would never advise against it because it's such a good tool against aggro decks. Our spells are mostly the same as well. I still like the two shakedown. Uh, we go three guiding. We don't have Pell Cascade. Instead, we're gonna go with the because we need a space for the Ilawi spells, and we'll see that down here. I do like the two Sunbless bigger as a way to potentially get some of my units more HP as needed. Uh, three Acid Protection, very straightforward. One Bastion to protect the Ilawi that gets a Vengeance or something. And then here we have, since we didn't have TK, we need another way to be able to remove opponent's units. And one of the ways that we're going to do this is going to be Tentacle Smash. So this will allow you to be able to trade with one of the opponent's unit. If your Tentacle is big enough, you can also save it, meaning that you're able to use Heal It Up afterwards. Uh, so between Tentacle Smash and Shakedown, I feel really confident about being able to deal with some of the opponent's threats. And then one of the reasons that we remove Pell Cascade is because instead we're going to play the Eye of Naga Kaboros. So we're still able to draw three two from here for five mana while also being able to summon at the very least a two two if you have all the tentacles on the field then obviously you're just buffing up your tentacles instead which is really really good 
Because the synergy, obviously, is that your tentacles, the bigger they get, the more value you get from being able to heal them. And the opponent needs to be careful about them, right? Because they they can just push it, put it, put in so much pressure on the opponent. So I really, 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 really like this, this style right here. I might explore around and see if we can fit in any other of the Alawi as support cards. But I like where this is sit right now. So I'm definitely going to give this a shot. This is going to be probably my personal day one deck. And that's just because of my obsession with Star Spring and Soraka in general. But, 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 there's another, there's another Alawi deck that I'm really excited for to try out that might become my day 1.5 deck because it's another champion that we all know and love. And of course, I'm talking about Udyr. So this is my Udyr Ilawi deck. So moving on for Soraka, the idea with Udyr in this package is that you're able to give regeneration to your tentacles, you're able to give regeneration to Ilawi, allowing them both to survive longer and longer. And on the long game, if the game goes long enough, you can also give overwhelm to like a big tentacle. So if you have like a really big tentacle in the field, you can put overwhelm on the bad boy because of the Udyr stances and be able to go from there. So triple Ilawi, triple Udyr, pretty straightforward. Uh, then we mix, we mix and match the package from Ilawi with the package from Udyr. So obviously from Udyr, we have the triple Bulping Wonder and the triple Inner Beast and two Hiara Osiers. The Hiara Osier, I think it's really good. I talked about this before when we had all those Udyr videos last month. I think this card is really underrated. And this package, I think, can make use of the fact that she discounts the card, allowing you to still be able to do the rest of the stuff that you want to do. So Wonder, Inner Beast, Osir, boom. That's our Udyr side. From Ilawi, aside from Ilawi, we have the Watchful Idol. It's just such a good one drop, letting you initially be able to start working on that spawn, right? We get two Boro Lookout, and the only reason I'm playing two is because she's competing on the five cost with Udyr, so I don't really, I don't really want to have six five drops, especially since we're playing Hiara Osir and Naga, Naga, Naga Kaboros. Uh, so she's just there to be able to give our existing, uh, our existing tentacles more power. We play one Naga Boros as a potential alternate finisher in case that the Udyr game plan doesn't work out, and then we also play triple tentacle smash triple Iron Nakaburo. So the Tentacle Smash is able allowing us to be able to remove our unit because we can give regeneration to a tentacle. It's good potential that, our, that we have a big tentacle that's able to survive long enough. And then the Iron Nakaburo is to be able to just draw and buff the tentacles because, because it is very important for us to be able to join to our champion. So the more draw, the better. And that's where the rest of the cards in the deck work, right? So we have triple Sentry, to Fortune Croker. So both of these cards I think are very important because we need to be able to join to our combo pieces of Udyr, Ilawi, and, and other, you know, spawn cards. So we want to be able to draw while also being able to block with these units. Triple Tyrant Keeper is just there to keep us healthy because as you can see, we do kind of have a more higher curve. So we do we might be able to, we might be taking too much damage from some aggro and mid-range decks that we might have to heal up. I do play one Elixir Ryan just because I didn't want to play triple three sisters. Uh, Elixir Ryan can be really clutch at keeping your Ilawi or your Udyr alive, both of which need to attack. Three sisters just there as I get a yell card. And triple Trojan for the same way, to be able to keep your units alive against removal or blockage. This is another deck I'm super excited for. So even though I really was excited for Annie, and Annie's one of my favorite champions in the league, I... I'm really excited for Ilawi. I think I really like the play style of like Ilawi, being able to combine her with either Starspring or Udyr. So these two decks are the two that I'm going to try out first and kind of see how it goes and we go from there. But I, I'm, I'm really, 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 really excited for this. Obviously, you guys know me. I get excited for Udyr decks. So this is right up my alley. My alley. Now, there is a third Ilawi deck that I want to showcase. Uh, it's more kind of playing for the Shurima package, so kind of like how you have Diego Shurima, it's said that it's, it's going to be Ilawi Shurima. I don't know if it's actually going to be competitive, but, you know, couldn't really think of a third deck with the champion. So yeah, so so here it is. So it's a Mono Ilawi, Mono Ilawi Shurima deck. Again, similar to just Diego, right? It's actually playing a lot of the same cards, right? So we're playing Triple Chronomancer, Triple Merciless Hunter, we go one Bakai Sand Spinner, 
We have the double writer calling just so that we can guarantee that we draw the Lowry. I said that the writer calling is a little bit worse because we don't have the miss compared to how Diego has the miss. So that's why we end up playing double Doom Keeper so that we have something that we can sacrifice for the writer calling if we need to. Uh, worst comes to worst, obviously we can just sacrifice one of our other units. It is what it is because I do think Ilawi is very important. Triple Ancient Hourglass to save her, Triple Quicksand to just survive against random stuff, and Double Rider Negation to also protect her. So then we mix that Shurima Protection Package with the Nice and, and Hourglass and Quicksand with the Bilgewater Ilawi Package. So literally all the Bilgewater cards are just the Ilawi, Ilawi Package. So Triple Ilawi, uh, we do Triple Watchful Idol, Triple Sea Boys. And the reason I like this card is because it does give us an alternate win condition where we can also give overwhelm to our tentacles, which is really, really nice. And it's also a nice three job with three health because we only have Merciless Hunter as blocker. Uh, Baru, set, Baru Lookout, sorry. And then two Naga Kaboros as an alternate way, way to also win the game. And then obviously that we talked about with the Udir deck and the Soraka deck, triple tentacle smash, triple iron naga, naga kaburas, which are both really good in the resource war uh, to be able to remove opponent's units or be able to keep our hand in a healthy state. And then to kind of close up the deck, we play one of chamber renewal. So obviously the one of chamber renewal there is just there to give Ilawi the spell shield. How often is that going to happen? Probably not that often. It might end up becoming a dead draw more times than not. Uh, but we do have a lot of ways to draw our champion with three Lowys and two Rider Collins, so hopefully that's not the case. We also have a lot of predicts, so we'll see. But this is what, I, this is what I'm thinking of on the Ilawi Shurima package. Uh, I do think Biego Shurima is probably still a lot better than this because Biego has a much more impactful level up, right? Biego just wins you the game most of the times if he's able to level up. Um, but this is also still interesting, I think. This is still pretty interesting to play around with and see, see see if it can work out in a deck that you just try to focus on Ilawi and be able to level her up. So so that's Annie, Jane, and Ilawi out of the way. Now we go to Bar, which all three decks that I'm going to present you with Bar, I think are pretty, 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 pretty toxic. So yeah, I think Bar is going to be a very toxic champion with elusive win condition. So yeah, if you're into that, then here we go. Here we go to the Bar deep end of the world. So, like I said, Bar, I think it's a little bit toxic just because he enables so much elusive shenanigans. So what is the first deck that I'm thinking of? A deck that's already been pretty popular in this past couple of weeks? Fey Swarm. So before I even go into this deck though, just let you know, when Bar really to me, Bar is three cards. It's Bar, Bird, and Esmos. All my bar decks are just gonna, that's the only cards that you're gonna have from bar. Now, this one does play Mystic Vortex, but I don't think Mystic Vortex is actually correct. I just wanted to leave it there as additional draw. But, anyways, let's think about this deck. So, this deck is just combining the bar package and then combining that with all the uh, nonsense from attached units. So, one thing you need to remember from attached units is that if an attached unit gets buffed by like a shine or any other hand buff, when it gets sent back to your hand, if the unit that is attached to die, it still keeps those buffs permanently. So let's say that we get lucky and our chimes hit our rainbow fish, then the rainbow fish is gonna be a 3-2 forever, or maybe a 4-3 or more. Even if the unit that is attached to dies, when the rainbow fish comes back, it's still gonna be buffed up. That's where the synergy comes in. So obviously, the whole point of bar is to be able to buff your units in your hand, and this deck has a lot of units that are nice to buff, right? So Fizz is nutty to buff. Uh, I do think Commando is really good as well. Esmos is really good. Kelp Maiden, we're playing Kelp Maiden to give ourselves more elusives that we can buff. And then Rainbow Fish and Paper Crab. So you end up having all these units that can get buffed by the Shimes that actually can provide you value. Obviously, some of the bad hits that you could do, like you could hit them on Burr, Jota Squire, Grandfather Face, probably not great to hit on. Uh, Gleaming Lantern is actually okay. Like If you hit it on Gleaming Lantern, that's fine, because it means your Gleaming Lantern now has four health and can potentially survive. Now, the good thing, though, is that even if you hit one of those slow rolls, like the Fae, the Lantern, or even your Owl Cats, it doesn't matter, because you have the Rainbow Fish to be able to give them elusive. So even if the Shines do not hit one of your elusive units, 
as long as you have a rainbow fish, you can still make cup for it and still make that unit elusive, which is nuts. Uh, obviously, from the spell side, it's just the standard triple face power, which you can send again with the Gleaming Lantern. A double trinket trade, one plane spitter, two pokey, two hidden pathways. So the reason I'm playing hidden pathways is because since we're not playing target like a Phileas, like a Phileas Fist, we lose access to Guiding Touch, we lose access to Pelka Cascade. So I feel like I need a little bit more draw, especially because draw can be really good synergizing with 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 Bard. So I think even though hidden pathways is a little bit expensive at four mana, um, I think it's still worth it, right? You're always gonna trigger this really easily because you have Grandfather Fade and other cards that create cards. Uh, but even a format, I think it's pretty good. We might even go up to three. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, I think this deck is is very toxic. Um, because if you get lucky with how the chimes go, opponents can have a hard time dealing with your with your units. And on top of that, you're still getting all the value from Gleaming Lantern being able to let you go wide in your board. So yeah, I think this deck is really, 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 really good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say about this. Like, I think Bar is going to end up being the, the strongest champion of this expansion, if I, if you're asking me. And this is because of the type of decks that you can build with him that get to avoid the interaction from the opponent while being able to buffer their losers. I just, as you also see in the next two decks, the next two Bar decks that I'm about to showcase. So this next version of Bar is kind of doing the same game plan where you're going for elusives. I said that this one is playing Ionia. So this is more reminiscent, reminiscent of the old like Ionia failure hand buff deck and kind of taking advantage of that uh, by being able to just buff up your elusives and being able to get a lot of value that way and being able to protect them with your deny and your nullifies, etc. for Ionia. So this is going to be triple set, triple bar, because obviously if set gets buffed up as well by the chimes, that's really, really big, because set, set is able to copy the stats into the living shadow. So if this gets buffed even just one once, now you have a 4-3 that's attacking twice, right? So you have 4-3 and 4-3. Opponent's going to have a really hard time being able to, to stop that. Like we talked about, we have the bar package. Triple bar, triple burr, triple asmus. That's all you need. That's all you need from bar. The rest of the cards are Ionia cards. Now, I do play triple Shadow Apprentice instead of like triple uh, Dancing Droplet because the Shadow Apprentice at least has a chance to potentially synergize as we said. We don't really have a ton of recall in this deck, especially because I ended up cutting the two drop that recalls a card. Uh, so we are a little, a little bit low on the draw by not having the, uh, the Dancing Droplet, but I think it's okay. Uh, triple Gringley Duo. If, you, if she gets buffed, then she's no longer vulnerable to like Battlefix and stuff. Now, the Nabori is probably the, the low roll of this deck, together with the Saint and Thousand Tails. Uh, but the Nabori is not so bad, because if you get enough chance on this, this can become a pretty good, pretty good unit. The idea here, though, is that we want to have at least something that we can use to be able to block against, like, aggro decks. And the Highwayman is a, guy, a new, nice card that you can just throw down and be able to block, or you can also combine that with the Gringley Duo to be able to push a lot of damage. Shadow Assassin just to draw, and another Elusive that's going to get buffed up. King Q Life Plate. If this card gets buffed uh, by the Shimes, then you have a really big swing. Because now you have a Lifesteal unit that's also Elusive, that's potentially have 3-3 three, three or 4-4 four, four stat line. And then Saint and Thousand Tells is just there to get us more cards, as well as be able to trigger the Chimes, right? Because this is giving every, like, drawing twice, and giving everything plus one, plus one. And then we just protect our units with, with you know, the usual Ioni stuff. Double deny, double, de double deny, double nullify, a uh, trick twin, which you're usually doing for health, but sometimes you can use it to push lethal damage. And then I do run three on cost of palm, kind of similar to what we talked about with the highway man. Gives us a blocker that we can use to be able to block against the opponent attack and not let them just rush us down. Uh, so it lets us block stuff, you know, that's really big. You know, it stuns them the first time and then still leaves the blocker there for, for the next turn. So this deck is also pretty nutty, I think. And it might be one of the best bar decks as well. <sighs> like, I would not want to go against this if I if I was playing rank. So, really, really crazy to me how much this bar card and, and his archetype might be able to enable in terms of like hand buffing the units in your hand. So yeah, yeah, pretty 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 darn good, pretty good card, pretty good card. So yeah, let's move on to the third. A bar deck, which is also kind of like elusive base, but with a splash of 
PNC instead of Ionia or Bandle City. So yeah, so this is the last one that I'm going to showcase for Bar, and this one is playing Teemo. Now this one was inspired by Silver Fuse. I saw she posted like a Teemo Victor Bar deck on Twitter. Uh, all I did was change, remove the two Victor and just go triple Teemo. I think Victor is not really doing a lot in this archetype compared to just having a big Teemo that can potentially get buffed up by the Shimes and be able to just push damage there. Like just having these elusives is more important than having something like Victor in my opinion. So we have triple Teemo and obviously the bar pack is still the same. Burr, Esmos, Bar, boom. No reason to discuss that. We have triple Teemo. We have one Daring Portal just to kind of round out our deck because obviously we have 39 cards and we need a one card to be a one of. So one Daring Portal, triple Teemo are both really good hits early on. Uh, the idea with this version of the deck is less elusives and more just being able to have a lot of draw to be able to trigger as many charms as possible. So we have stuff like Senate Urchin, right? And we have stuff like Stress Testing, Rummage, all three of which can draw units, uh, can draw cards, allowing you to potentially trigger the shines over and over and over again. At the same time, they can synergize by discarding some of the stuff like the Flame Chompers, which we play Triple Baboon and Triple Flame Chompers here. Because the Flame Chompers themselves, especially if you have the Flame Chompers naturally in your hand, or if you play the Boom Boom first, they could also get buffed by the Chimes, which is not a bad target. It's not an elusive target, but being able to have a buff the Flame Chompers is not bad because it will let you trade and remove favorably, favorably into the opponent's different units. Obviously, Asmus is just there as another elusive unit that can also grant your Chompers plus one plus one, which is really nice. Triple Pearl Cannon. Now, obviously, you can leave the pearls in your hand to be able to let them get hit, or you can just play them out and combine that with the other cards. Triple Stress Testing can combine with either the Senate or the Pearl. Uh, and then you have some Burn with Mystic and get excited as well to kind of take advantage and be able to finish up if you're not able to push more damage with your units. Uh, and then the Suit Up, because we are drawing enough that I feel like the Suit Up could be really nice. You can put the Suit Up on like a Timor or a Daring Pearl that didn't get hit by any chimes and be able to push damage that way. Even putting it on the Esmos is also pretty good. Uh, so I think suit up kind of makes sense in this deck. If anything, I might also I might remove one suit up and maybe add one augmenter experimenter just so that we have some draw engine in case that we run out of resources too quickly. Uh, but we'll see as we play around a little bit more with that. So yeah, this is this is another version of bar that's a little bit different than the just pure elusives from Vandal or Ionia. It plays more towards the chumpers win condition while also still being able to combine elusive so it's kind of like a different flavor of it uh when you're going for a little bit more boring kind of kind of reminiscent of like fist team of uh, fist um fist twisted fate where you just have suit up and you're just pushing a lot of damage with your elusives and the amount of cards you can draw so yeah so that's it that's it for all the decks that i have to showcase today for the new champions Let's move on to some more variety decks. So this is going to be the deck coming up now are going to be decks for all archetypes that got a little bit upgraded with some of the cards uh, that we release. So let me let me let me know what you think. We'll go ahead and first start with deep. So this deep list, deep list looks very close to the list that I posted on my channel a couple of weeks ago. If you guys watched that video on deep, you saw that I'm not a fan of Maokai. Right, I'm not a fan of Maokai, and in that list, I have zero Maokais. I decided to go back to one Maokai here, uh, just as an alternate win condition in case that we need to. But I think anything more than that is, is not great. I think I just want to keep Maokais to potentially be able to draw our little opponent's deck. Uh, the way that this version of the deck works is more taking advantage of stuff like Fading Memories uh, to be able to still be able to go deep. I've been doing Fading Memories on the Dredgers or the Dublin Wonder. While also those ephemeral units, when they die, they're able to trigger the Sea Scarab. So uh, the idea here is more that we rely more on Lord of the Deaths to be able to draw into the Sea Scarab. Uh, be, with that said, that's why we only have four other Sea Monsters, two Abyssalites, two Devourers. Because if we do get the Lord of the Deaths in our hand, we almost always, always want to hit the Sea Scarab over anything else. Uh, to make up for a lack of sea monsters here, we do play triple jaw hunters, which you can also copy with the faded memories, allowing you to get more sea monsters in your hand while being able to challenge and kill the opponent's unit. Um, 
And then obviously the big addition here with the update was the addition of Undergrowth. So Undergrowth is a three mana fast speed spell that tosses three and drain two from a unit. So you're able to kill an opponent's unit that has two health while also being able to toss three. So you're able to both stall out by being able to heal and move in a unit and also be able to advance your deep condition, which I think is huge. I think this card alone is enough to make deep really, really playable again. So the rest of the card, like I said, is the rest of the deck is pretty standard. Now we, you know, we still have triple biofist, turbo well to be able to deal with all the aggro, especially at the beginning of the season, triple vengeance to be able to deal with the big threats, Pantheon, Udyrs, Ilawis, Viegos, etc. Uh, two Savage to be able to draw. I think draw is pretty nice in this deck. And yeah, the Fading Memory, again, you just combine into a lot, with a lot of the cards in this deck and, and then go from there. I'm not sure about if I like the Maokai, I might cut it out again. Because uh, the good thing about having zero Maokai sometimes is that you always know the Nautilus is going to be in the bottom of your deck. And you're able to draw into his Champion spell, which is actually really, really good against a lot of things in the meta right now. Being able to send something back into their deck. Uh, so that's also one of the benefits of having just triple Nautilus in the field. But... A lot of people on Twitter were coming at me because they said the Maka is really good. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and give it just Maka a shot. So yeah, so this, this will be my updated version of Deep. So let's go ahead now to the next deck. So let's move on to the next deck that got a little bit updated. And by a little, I, be, I mean a lot in this patch. And that is Thralls. The only card that really makes a difference here is this card. Harbinger of the Thralls. This card is such a nutty, nutty buff for this archetype. One of the ways that uh, Thralls used to lose is by not drawing Lysandra or Frozen Thrall early enough. So you sometimes you don't get either of your Thralls that in the field, and then you end up with a bunch of cards that want to advance the Thralls, but not really not any Thralls to actually advance. Harbinger adds an additional three cards now to your deck that can add a Thrall on turn two while also being a good blocker. And if you draw this late into the game, it's not even bad because it can advance all your frozen throws by one round. So not only can it create, but it also has the flexibility of just advancing. This is probably one of the best support cards that the Riot has ever released for an all archetype. Probably the probably the next best is like, we were just talking about deep, probably the Sea Scarab is the second, or actually I would say Sea Scarab is probably better than this. I think Sea Scarab was the best support card they ever released. And this one is very close up there as well. Uh, so I'm really glad to see Ryan understanding what some of these archetypes need and how they can potentially buff it. I do think Thralls are going to be really strong uh, in this in this meta. The problem is that they're still going to lose to stuff like the Demacia decks because of Rally. So you just got to keep that in mind. The rest of the deck is pretty straightforward if you have played Thralls before. So Triple Lissandra, Triple Talia. Uh, Talia is there to combine, to be able to duplicate your Thrall, especially if you're able to like reduce the cost of your, or the countdown of your Thralls before you summon Talia. Or if you can even do Promise in Future on it, then you can get a really nasty combo where you can do Promise in Future on your first one Thrall and copy with Talia. And now you have four Thralls that can get summoned once that first one Thrall comes down to zero. Uh, we played three Thralls. Triple Rubin and two Perseverium. Uh, you know, Perseverium is just nice little draw, and Rubin is there to be able to allow you to survive. Curator, reduce the countdown, right? Tavern Keeper, keep you healthy. We play one Clock Hand as a nice way to later in the game be able to release those throws that are still kind of stuck. Uh, Imagine Possibilities is really good to combine, especially with Talia. Uh, three Sisters, just there to kind of save us. Time in a Bottle, again. Reduces the countdown and lets us predict. Uh, I like to go do double Aisha, do, uh, double Aisha, double Avalanche instead of triple Avalanche. Aisha does have some merits against, you know, be able to respond a fast piece, a fast speed versus slow that Avalanche has. So I like to just play my odds here. Promising future for the combo that like we talked about. One right negation and one succumb to the call. Uh, succumb to the call is really just there to stop like the big rainbow fish. Uh, to give us an additional heal on top of like three sisters to be able to stop like the rainbow fish or something like that. So really, 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 really solid deck list in my opinion. And I do expect this deck list to see a lot of play in the patch. So, you know, hopefully go ahead and give this a shot uh, as we keep exploring some of the old, older archetypes. The next older archetype that I had just buffed is Lurk. Now, I know everybody loves to hate on Lurk, but they get a really nice tool in this patch, which is blood in the water 
So it's a five mana lurk slow speed spell that deals one to anything then rallies. This can be really good with, with lurk because it could allow you to attack with your big overwhelm units again later in the game. So sometimes you might be just slightly off from being able to present lethal and now you no longer have to give the opponent that extra turn. Now you can just rally and just get to push that lethal right off the bat. Uh, the great thing about this card too is that it's lurk. So now we only have two, five. We only have five cards in the whole deck that are not lurk. Double Treasure Seeker and Trick Chronomancer. And the reason I'm still keeping the Treasure Seeker and the Chronomancer is because they're very important for what Lurk wants to do. You want to be able to attack on one if you have the attack token. So having the additional Treasure Seeker here a lot gives you 8 out of 40 cards to be able to get one of them on turn 1 and be able to attack. If you if you have the attack token on turn 1 and you don't have a 1 drop, that's really, really bad. So we cannot completely cut a Treasure Seeker. And then obviously the Chronomancer just combines so well with Rex and Pike. That there's no reason to cut it either. What we ended up cutting was more stuff like Bone Skewer or Ruthless Predator, which I think were a little bit more low value than what you're gonna get from something like Blood in the Water. Again, the combo here is that later in the game, maybe you have like a big Under Titan, a big Doom Breaker, and need to just push that last little bit of damage with your Overwhelms, and you can just do Blood in the Water to be able to do exactly that. So, really, really fun. I think this might make Lurk a little bit better again after the Pike Nerf. I think the Pike Nerf. Kind of almost kill the deck uh so hopefully this can give it a little bit more a little bit more oomph to be able to 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 actually do something uh so yeah so here here it is for all you lurk enjoyers so the next art type i wanted to touch on is going to be stalia malphite and there's two cards that i think could be decent upgrades in this deck so one of them is going to be the wind and light so the wind and light is a seven mana knife will give all the allies plus two plus one over on this round so this allows you to give not only your Malfa and Talia Overwhelm, but also your, your, your big grumpy rock bear that gets summoned and sometimes is an overwhelm. So it can combine really nicely with some of those cards and be able to just give you give you just the, just enough oomph, just enough push to be able to actually present lethal for the opponent. The other card that I added was Dragon's Roost. So I went to two Soul Spires and two Dragon's Roost. Obviously, Dragon's Roost can combine with Talia to be able to summon two ambitious, ambitious bots, which are pretty nice. I think it's nice. I think, I think it's nice value and could actually be pretty decent for, for just a three mana landmark in a deck that's still relying on being able to, to, to duplicate landmarks or be able to summon landmarks. Uh, so I think it's really, really good, especially if you're like, like sometimes one of the awkward parts is not having anything to do on turn three. Uh, so having this in addition to the endless debug gives us another thing that we could do on turn three instead of just having to only play Perseverance or something like that. Uh, so yeah, the rest of the deck is pretty straightforward for a Talia Malphite deck. I did go down to two Malphite, by the way. I think three kind of felt a little bit clunky, especially now that we have another seven drop. Um, so yeah, so I mean, the rest is pretty straightforward. A lot of landmarks to be able to level up Talia Malphite, like Preparation, Perseverance, Druze, Salt Spire, and Rubble Earth, all of which are able to level up our units. Same thing with the Endless Debau and the Sarcophagus. But that's a little bit different, same thing with the Rock Hopper. Um, obviously, the idea is that you're combining Talia with one of these two landmarks to be able to summon two units instead of just one. Two units that can put a lot of pressure into the opponent instead of just, you know, not having that value. Obviously, early on, our early units, Chip becomes a really good blocker against Aggro. Rock Hopper makes it really accurate for the opponent to develop. The Bow, if the opponent kills it, it's just going to be enable your Desert Naturalist or your Rite of Arcane. Uh, and then we talked about Wind and Light, and then, you know, some other support spells, some Pell Cascades, some Absorbers, in case that you don't get the Wind, the wind and Light, Quicksand to survive, run a Negation to keep our units alive, and one Celeste Wonder as kind of like a get out of the card. So, this, I think, could have some potential as well. Obviously, the Malphite buff is really, really good. Uh, last patch, but unfortunately, I feel like he fell out of flavor towards the end of the season. So, hopefully, something like this could give us some life again in the meta. Uh, so yeah, so let's move on. Let's move on to the last deck that I'm gonna showcase today. So to finish up the day, I'm gonna show you guys some Copium Legion Deserter deck. So the whole idea on why I'm trying to bring this into the light <laughs> or, or showcase this is because Legion Deserter gets buffed by ally buffs everywhere. So he actually gets the buffs from Rumble. So the idea here is that you can play Rumble on turn four. And you can play the setter on turn five, and your deserter is gonna have spell shield, impact, quick attack, 
and also overwhelm because he naturally has overwhelm so this gives you another unit that's going to have spell shield quick attack overwhelm because the way that the rumble buff works is that if you, if you discard three cards it gives rumbles everywhere the quick attack impact of spell shield so it's actually going to synergize with the legion deserter uh, so that's that's the main idea of the deck, the main idea of this deck. Now, I didn't want to be boring and go like PNC package, so instead I decided to go more like a field promotion Demacia package, where obviously the idea is that you're able to give field promotion to a Rumble and be able to attack multiple times with the Rumble and level him up in a single turn. Uh, you also have Cataclysm, and Golden Ages to be able to rally and be able to push damage. Because in addition to Legion the Surter, we want to be adding another card here that can actually buff the Deserter, and the other card is actually the Legion Marduder, and we also play stress in numbers. So the idea with the Legion Mar Maruder is that his buffs are also gonna apply to the Deserter. So your Deserter can get really big really quickly if you're able to attack with the Maruder multiple times in the game, um, which, which is really, really cool. The rest of the cards is more like this card Nexus package to give us this card fodder for Rumble. So stuff like Grenadier, Fallen Rider, and Lost Soul, I able to give us some of that discard fodder. I do play three Rune Weaver because the blades can be discard fodder, but you can also get the Overwhelm Blade to be able to put into a Rumble in case that you don't get the Might to be able to put on him. Uh, Great Physician is just there to give us more, more draw. And then we do play one Draven to Katarina. And because we're playing one Draven, we're playing double Draven's biggest fan uh, to be able to guarantee that we get the Draven most times rather than not. Uh, we can also discard the biggest fan if we really have a Draven on the field. And obviously, it gives us access to the Aces, aces which are pretty important. And then Katarina is just there to synergize with the Marauder, Rumble, and the Setter, all of which want to attack multiple times uh, in a turn, right? So Katarina is another rally, rally in top of our Golden Ages, Cataclysm, and Field Promotion to be able to get a lot of value there, which I think, I think is pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool, and I think... This deck has some potential to be able to cheese opponents. Uh, so I'm actually kind of interested to try this out. I, I have a lot of hope for the Legion Deserter. It's just trying to find what the right package is that can buff him up. Obviously, you can do like Biego Miss, uh, but I think something like this with Rumble is a little bit better because it gives your Deserter Spell Shield, which is very, very important. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, anyways, that is the last deck that I wanted to showcase today. And... I in the description below, you will find my, 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 you will find the deck codes for all of these decks and the links, but you can also go directly to our Runeterra AR profile, which is your runeterra.ar slash determine. And you can look at our profile there. You can follow us so that you can actually keep track of every time that we post a new deck. So here you can see all the decks that we posted that are, that are showcased today in this YouTube video. Uh, but. Aside from that, really, really excited about this patch. I think it's going to be really, really fun. I think there's a lot of nice things to try out. Like I said, I'm really, really excited for Ilawi more than anything else. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to see how she plays out. Um, and if she actually finds a spot in the meta. My fear is that she might be like Udir, where she might be a little bit too weak. Uh, yeah, so yeah, like I said, all the decks are here. My Runeterra AR profile. As always, if you like the content, please make sure to like the video below. You can also subscribe to us. We post LOR videos every single day. So obviously expect some videos coming in with the new patch dropping in tomorrow. You can also find us on Twitch at Twitch where we stream three to four times a week. And you can also find us on Discord and Twitter. The links to those are both in the description below. Hopefully I gave you enough decks for you to brew and think about in your head. And good luck in your climbs tomorrow. And I hope you have a lot of fun and maybe we run into each other in rank or any of the other matches. So, okay, I've been talking a lot. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you everybody for watching. I'll see you all again tomorrow.